the Happy Families Podcast. It's the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. When we tell our kids to do something that they don't want to do, especially as toddlers, they're kind of going, hang on, that's not what I want to do. And you're the person who's supposed to love me more than anything in the world. And you're telling me to do something that doesn't make sense to me because I want to be here now. And now here's the stars of our show. My mum and dad. G'day, this is Dr. Justin Coulson. I'm the founder of happyfamilies.com.au and uh, the author of six books about raising happy families. I'm here with Kylie, my wife, and mum to our six daughters. Hi, Kylie. Hi. <laughs> We've got a Q&A uh, that's come through, a question via podcasts at happyfamilies.com.au. We're talking toddlers today. Tracy has asked us a couple of questions in relation to her two-and-a-half-year-old. She is dealing with tantrums in lots of different areas, one of them being dealing with transitions. We've got to leave the house and we have a tantrum because we don't want to go. And we've got to leave the park and we've got another tantrum because we don't want to go. (laughs) And so she's been resorting to bribes and, you know, saying, if you leave now, we can watch the TV when we get home. Or if you leave now, I'll give you this this treat or this, you know, kind of favourite food or whatever. And she's wanting to know whether or not there's any detrimental impact to her children long term if she continues doing this and then secondly having this defiantly independent child who has to do everything for themselves and if she inadvertently steps in and turns the light switch on and the toddler wants to do it we've got massive tantrums again and she doesn't know how to diffuse the situation and so what she's having to do is just ride it out so what can Tracy do to diffuse these tantrums Let's dive into this. First of all, we've got to talk about developmental realities. When we're talking, we call it the terrible twos for a reason because their brains are not developed enough to understand the stuff that we want them to understand. They're agitating for something that they want. We're agitating for something that we want. And it's like this unstoppable force meets an immovable object. We're the unstoppable force. We're on our way to do something. We've got stuff to do. And the immovable object is the toddler. There's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, our toddlers don't understand time. Like when you say we're leaving in five minutes, a toddler doesn't know what five minutes is. A toddler doesn't really know what we're leaving is. They kind of do a little bit, but they don't have the developed knowledge that we want them to have so that they can get themselves ready mentally for the shift. A couple of other things that are really going against them as well. There's this thing called theory of mind. Theory of mind means that your toddler understands what's happening in your brain. So, you know, as, a, as an adult, Kylie, when I want to do something, you can usually infer what my motivation is. Uh, if I walk into the kitchen, you can usually tell I must be hungry. But for a toddler, they don't know how to read another person's mind like we as adults seem to do an okay job at most of the time. It's not until they get to about the age of five, maybe even six for slower developing children before they start to have this theory of mind. So when we tell our kids to do something that they don't want to do, especially as toddlers, they're kind of going, hang on, that's not what I want to do. And you're the person who's supposed to love me more than anything in the world. And you're telling me to do something that doesn't make sense to me because I want to be here now. Like there is only the present. I'm in the middle of something. And now you're asking me to stop. Why would you do that? That's really distressing for a toddler. So those two developmental realities, no concept of time and no theory of mind, that that psychological brain development thing that won't happen for a few years, plus the fact that toddlers really do live in the present, make transitions really, really tricky. Now, that's the the very brief developmental summary. What do we do? Well, you've worked in childcare for, for years. What did you used to do? I think there's a couple of things that are really, really important and they can be really tricky when you're in a family situation as opposed to a classroom situation because things change regularly on the day-to-day with family life. But toddlers in particular need more structure than just about any other age group. They need to understand and know this happens and then this happens and then this happens. So they like structure, they like predictability, they like routine, which means that if they're watching their favourite show, uh, Tracy, at, uh, I don't know, maybe they're watching Bluey on the ABC and that's what they do in the morning and then you say as soon as Bluey's over, we get in the car and we go to the park or as soon as mummy's had a shower, we get in the car and we go to the park. What we want to do is we want to stack this habit. We want to create this routine, this predictability and keep it as structured as is reasonable while still allowing for the the appropriate flexibility that every family needs. 
That's yep. the first thing. So with those transitions, it might not necessarily be that you do the same thing every day, but you might have little cues that are the same every day that help your child to know that at the end of this song or at the end of this show or at the end of um, the timer going off, if you set a timer, there is going to be a change. So we're not going to keep doing what we're doing because once you hear that cue – we're going to now move into the next activity. So in our, in our home, we used to, we don't do it anymore. We probably should start again, but particularly when the children were younger, we would have a morning routine and the children all knew that when I played this song on the piano, everybody had to come into the living room. It was family time before the day really got underway and everything went a bit haywire. They knew that that song was the cue no matter what you're doing, drop it, come into the living room, let's have our family time. And you can create those same, same kinds of predictable cues that lead to the next thing, that lead to the transition. And it's incredibly powerful to- powerful for toddlers. The second thing that I think we could probably give us a hint for Tracy uh, in, in answering this transitions difficulty is just to set a timer. Uh, because children don't understand what five minutes is or 10 minutes, uh, let them know. We're going to set the timer and when the timer goes off, that's when it's time to leave. It could be the oven timer, you could use your phone, you can use an iPad or tablet or whatever it is. Ideally, get them to set it because that way they're part of the process. And Especially in Tracy's situation, she's got a a wonderfully independent two and a half year old who just wants to do things for herself. And so this is a perfect way to actually let her feel like she actually has control over what's going on in her world. And you'll find that toddlers, in fact, you'll find that anybody who has that level of control over what's happening will then respond positively when the transition arrives. Let's talk about Tracy's dealing with the independence stuff with her toddler right after the break. It's the Happy Families Podcast. Are screens creating tension at home? Tweens, Teens and Screens is a webinar to guide families to healthy, safe, super screen solutions. Buy today at happyfamilies.com.au slash shop. It's the Happy Families Podcast, the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. And today we are answering Tracy's dilemma about how we deal with toddler tantrums. Tracy said that she's got a child who is extremely independent. You know what it's like? You try to dress them. No, I'm going to do it. They, they can't do it. They don't have the skills to do it. They've got no idea what they're doing, but I've got to do it. Are you you're trying to feed them? No, I'm going to do it. And, and no matter what you do, they insist on doing it drives you crazy takes 10 times longer than it should you end up doing it anyway but now they're having a big tantrum uh we've got to be able to help them to to manage that that desire that inbuilt natural healthy desire for complete autonomy you know it's been quite a few years since we've had a toddler in the house but i can vividly remember each of our girls at some point being allowed to do something that was driving me crazy because it was taking them way longer than they needed to do it but just how proud they were when they accomplished the impossible. And I think that, you know, as we look at this challenging situation, if we can just find a way to work through it and allow them the autonomy to, to master these skills over time, we just see this child who, who grows in confidence the research on this is really important and I can't emphasize it enough to tell you exactly what the research says. I want to quote from my book, 21 Days to a Happier Family. It says, in a study of mothers and infants, one-year-old children were taught to play with some toys by their mum. Then the children were observed as they played on their own. When mothers were controlling in the way they taught their children to play, the children were less persistent and motivated to play with their toys than those children whose mothers had been more autonomy oriented in the way that they taught. Children with autonomy supportive mothers were delighted to have some free play and enjoyed playing with the toys even when their mum was gone. So you know when you give your kids a toy and then you sit there and show them how to do it, how to use it? No, not like this, do it like that. Oh, no, 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 don't push that button over there. You've got to do this bit first. The more controlling the mums were, the less the children liked playing with the toy. And when they got the free play opportunity, they pretty much ignored the toy, didn't want to go near there because their parents were too controlling like it's inbuilt whereas the children who were given the the freedom to explore it with mum present they ended up enjoying it more and persisted with play even during the free play period that's the difference between autonomy support and being controlling what i think is also really interesting is this a follow-up study eight months later showed those children with autonomy supportive mums at the original play session were still more willing to persist in their play and were actually more competent in the way that they played So autonomy supportive parenting encourages kids to explore and become broader in their thinking and children 
figure out their choices and their options themselves, it leads to better outcomes. There was another study as well. I'm just going to quote one last study uh, because I'm geeking out with the science for just a sec. Another study showed six and seven-year-olds with their mums, same pattern of results. Children played with these construction toys with their mums and the way that mums spoke to their children was coded as either being controlling or autonomy supportive or neutral and when the play session was over the kids were left alone for five minutes for a free play session and the results showed that mums who were controlling in their talk had children who showed less intrinsic motivation to play so the mums who were saying okay now put this one over there or i think you should do that they impacted that sense of control when i'm thinking about tracy's experience with her two and a half year old this little toddler it reminds me of a dad that i spent some time with in melbourne back in the days when i used to do one-on-one coaching I'd just done a big presentation at a school. I've shown up in the living room of this family so that I can talk to mum, dad, and they had a a babysitter looking after their their little guy. Uh, I think his name was Cody, the little boy. And the dad said, he just wants to do everything himself. It's driving me up the wall. I said, well, that's kind of what they do. He said, no, 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 but I'll give you an example. We tried to leave the house the other night. It was a bit later than normal. He probably should have been in bed but we had to take him in the car to go and drop something off to someone's place. And as I walked out of the house, I flicked the light switch off and he was like, he just had this meltdown because he wanted to turn off the light switch. And I said, well, what did you do? He said, well, I told him to grow up and stop being a pain and I, he put him in the car and he said he wouldn't get in his car seat so he's got his forearm across his chest and he's got his knee in his groin and he's trying to rip the sort of the, the what do you call them, the shoulder harness around, the, around this poor little I toddler. really shouldn't laugh, but I... <laughs> You know what it's like, <laughs> We've been and they try to so slide out of the. And, and it's like, how hard is it to get a child? I, I've actually slid down in my slid down in my seat right now. I'm almost on the floor because I'm being the toddler with the arms up and kicking and fussing. And, and I said to this dad, "Why'd you do that?" He said, "Well, he's got to learn. I'm in charge. I've switched the light off. I'm not going to turn the light on and let him turn it off." And I said, "Well, why not? Let's let's walk through it. Imagine if he had this tantrum." because he's independent and he wants to do things because he's big enough to do them now. He thinks he's a big boy. Imagine if he gets upset and so you walk back to the house and say, sorry, Cody, let, let me give you the chance to do it. So you turn the light on and he turns it off and then you walk out of the house and close the door. What happens then? And this dad, he looks at me and he's like, probably nothing. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, oh, he's just going to get in a car seat. Is he going to cry? No. You're going to have to force him with your knee and your forearm and you're going to have to wrestle him into it. No. And, and I think when I hear a story like this, that we've just got to give our kids a bit more independence, like get off their back. Let them be independent. Let them do stuff on their own. This is how they learn and grow. We want our children to grow up and be responsible and capable and competent, and yet we do everything for them. Two-year-olds are meant to do this. It's developmentally appropriate, so let them do it. And if they make a bit of a mess... You clean it up. If they get stuck, you, you walk in and say, oh, you look a bit stuck. How can I help? It's really that easy. I know I've taken a bit of time to share that, but the research evidence behind this is really clear. Our kids need connection and they need us to stop controlling. So what if we're in a situation, though, we've tried everything and no matter what we do, we just can't do anything right by our toddler they are losing the plot and it doesn't matter what we do. They're just going for it. We could be at home. We could be in the shopping center. We could be at the park. They're just going for it. What am I going to do? So let's be really clear. Usually there's a build up. There's something that has happened and then something else has happened and it's built I'm up I'm going to that. say it's hangry. Yeah. Well, I was going to say there's triggers, right? Hungry, angry, lonely, tired and stressed. My H-A-L-T-S, HALTS little system that I talk about all the time. There's these triggers. On top of that, though, maybe we haven't given the appropriate transition time. Uh, We're at the park and it's time to go and we've said five minutes, but that doesn't mean anything. We haven't walked them through that. We haven't counted them down from five minutes to three minutes to one minute to, okay, let's go. Uh, Maybe we're in the shops, like you said. I mean, I know that this is an unfair thing to say, but to the extent that it's possible, don't take your kids shopping. They hate going to the shops. Do anything that you can. I know not everyone can do that. But to the extent that it's possible, get a babysitter, get someone to watch the kids, anything that you can to stop them. Or when you go there, set things up for success. It took me six children to learn that rule. I had spent so many years going and doing the grocery shopping with a whole heap of kids trailing behind me and it was just hard. It's torture. It was hard. For you and for everyone else in the shopping (laughs) centre. So you set them up for success by either giving them to a babysitter or to your partner or by saying, we're going to go into the shops and here's how it's going to go. So you give them a treat as you're going in. So they're content. They're not, they're not 
hungry or angry. Or the older kids, you might say, I'm going to get you to assist me. There's going to be a bit of service. We're going to do a challenge. See if you can run down that aisle and get that before I go down this aisle and get that. We want to get the kids active and involved if they're big enough or give them something to eat if they're too small to be involved. These are the kinds of really simple practical things that we can do to help our children to navigate our lives because sometimes they get dragged into them. So Kylie, what's the take home message if you were to summarize everything we've talked about? Well, I think there's three key points. Routine and structure are imperative for our toddlers. They need to know that their life is predictable. Yep. Number two, transition warnings. While they don't actually understand the the concept of time, they will understand those warnings. And if you give them multiple warnings, you're more likely to be successful. I'm going to change the word warnings to reminders. It's just a little bit nicer. I don't want to be warning my toddlers about anything, but this is coming up. And then lastly, giving our children as much autonomy as possible is going to give everybody a lot more peace. I mean, we could talk for ages about this. There's so much, but I think we need to wrap it up. Maybe I can wrap up by just highlighting this. All the details about what I'm about to share are on our Facebook page, Dr. Justin Coulson's Happy Families. We've got a summit coming up. This summit is called Little People, Big Feelings. The summit presented by happyfamilies.com.au. I've roped in eight of the world's best experts on toddlers. We're talking about Discipline. We're talking about fussy eating. We're talking about having fun and play. We're talking about discipline without damage. We're talking about when we should be sending them off to daycare or childcare or preschool or kindy or whatever it is that you call it where you are. Little People, Big Feelings is a summit for every parent of children under the age of five. It's uh, incredible value. We've got uh, Dr. Shafali Sabari. That's Oprah's parenting expert uh, and a bunch of other people. All the details on our Facebook page, Dr. Justin Coulson's Happy Families. It would be amazing to see you there. Let's wrap this up, though. We hope that you've enjoyed the Happy Families podcast. It's produced by Justin Rulon from Bridge Media. Craig Bruce is our executive producer. And if you have enjoyed the podcast, we ask you to please leave a five-star rating and review so that other people can find out about the podcast and make their families happier just like yours. If you'd like more info about the Little People Big Feelings Summit or just making your family happier generally, visit happyfamilies.com.au for more details.